modern era of board gamers to the Op Center. This is Ariskany, part of the Sit Rep Podcast, our channel dedicated to bringing you great modern military gaming content on Podbean, on Tabletop.com, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and other platforms. If you like what you see here, please consider supporting the Sit Rep with a subscription, a like, uh, a follow, a comment. Purple Smoke Grenade, M49 Trip Flare, Burst Transmission on your Tactical Field Radio, or with whichever option you feel most comfortable. You can also support us on Patreon, or check out our merchandise at Zazzle.com. So, the Op Center is a video series that puts a historical, real-world focus on modern-era wargaming and conflicts after 1945. For the last three episodes, we've been running a series on the Arab-Israeli Wars, with reviews on the 1956 Sinai War, the 67 Six-Day War, and the 73 Yom Kippur War. But now it's time to close out our series on the Arab-Israeli Wars with a look at the most recent era of this ongoing conflict. The Yom Kippur War in 1973 had massive implications for the Arab-Israeli conflict. If you haven't seen our episode on Yom Kippur, I highly suggest you check it out. This is considered by most to be the climax of the Arab-Israeli conflicts and a sharp dividing line between two major periods of this part of history. Yom Kippur's largest eventual effect was the official recognition of Israel by Egypt and the signing of the Camp David Accords. This established at least a nominal peace between Israel and Egypt, who is far and away the political and military powerhouse of any anti-Israeli Arab coalition. With Egypt and Israel at peace, there could never be a serious national-level war effort mounted against Israel. Thus, any opposition against Israel now primarily took the form of paramilitary action or outright terrorism. From a wargaming perspective, this means that after 1973, the Arab-Israeli conflict largely shifts from a tank brigades on open battlefields model, much more to a spec ops versus terrorist model, as we see in skirmish-level games like Spectre. Throughout the 1970s, in fact, pro-Palestinian terrorism continued to increase in frequency, audacity, and brutality, highlighted by a wave of airline hijackings. Perhaps the most famous example of this new counter-terrorism model of warfare would come in July 1976 with the daring Israeli raid on Entebbe. The Entebbe incident of 1976 started on 27 June, when an Air France flight from Athens to Paris was hijacked by four terrorists, two of them from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or PFLP. This flight had originated in Tel Aviv, so most of the passengers on board were Israeli nationals. The flight was diverted to Benghazi in Libya, where it was refueled, before flying on to Entebbe Airport in the African country of Uganda. Here, the four hijackers were joined by four more terrorists, reputedly supported by the leader of Uganda, Idi Amin. Demands were made for large sums of cash and for the immediate release of 53 Palestinian and pro-Palestinian prisoners, most of them held in Israel. To rescue the hostages, the Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, hatched a hitherto unprecedented plan built around a force of paratroopers, light infantry of the Krak Golani Brigade, and especially elite special forces of Sariet Matkal, or the General Staff Special Reconnaissance Unit, also known simply, and rather ominously, as Unit 269, modeled closely after the British SAS. Together, this force of about 100 men would be flown over 4,000 kilometers covertly to Ugandan airspace in American-made C-130 Hercules military transport. There, they would land, assault the terminal, rescue the hostages, fend off any counterattacks by the Ugandan army, disable nearby fighter jets of the Ugandan Air Force, take off again, refuel in nearby Kenya, and finally head home. Now, amazingly, the plan worked. Out of the 106 hostages, three were killed, one unfortunately by one of the commandos, and 102 were rescued. One other hostage had been hospitalized previously and was unfortunately left behind. Uh, she was later killed by Ugandan army officers. All the terrorists were killed, along with at least 30 Ugandan army soldiers. The Ugandans also lost 11 MiG-17 and MiG-21 fighter jets, destroyed on the runway at Entebbe Airport, which the Israelis feared could have been scrambled to shoot down the Hercules transports as they flew to freedom. The Israelis lost only one killed, the unit commander, Yonatan Netanyahu, 
older brother of Benjamin Netanyahu, the future Prime Minister of Israel. Several others were wounded, including one soldier paralyzed by a bullet in the neck. This is a sobering reminder of the risks taken by operators in units like this. There were also bloody reprisals by Uganda against Kenya, made in retaliation for Kenya's invaluable assistance during this daring raid. Now I don't have time to go into all the details here, but suffice it to say that the Entebbe raid would make a perfect counter-terrorism scenario for games like Spectre. The raid featured three different groups of the Israeli raiding force, each with its own specializations in training and equipment. The raid featured noise discipline, with silenced 22 caliber pistols used in a soft incursion attempt, uh, at least until a burst of automatic rifle fire blew the whole operation wide open. You have panicked hostages in the crossfire. You have terrorists hesitating to kill hostages once the assault gets started. You have uh, repelling external hostile forces while the op is still in progress. You have a fiery getaway. You have all of this. Put another way, not only was Entebbe the gold standard for every counterterrorism raid after 1976, but it was also the model for countless movies and TV shows, from documentaries and docudramas about the raid itself, to more light-hearted popcorn movies like Lee Marvin and Chuck Norris and Delta Force, and even future video games like Rainbow Six. All of it draws heavily from the real-life events of Entropy. Think of every cliché you may have ever seen in any kind of media in this whole subgenre. It was emulating Entropy that made it a cliché. Despite the shifts in Israel's strategic situation and the transition from conventional to non-conventional warfare, we still see occasional large-scale battlefield operations within the scope of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The biggest one of these is, of course, Operation Peace for Galilee, Israel's invasion of Lebanon in June 1982. As we've stated, through the 1970s, the PLO and associated groups were forced to move most of their bases of operations. Jordan was no longer a safe haven for them in the wake of the 1970 Black September War, while the Gaza Strip could no longer count on overt Egyptian support in the wake of the Camp David Accords. Meanwhile, however, Lebanon had been plunged into civil war since 1975, and since none of the warring factions in that unfortunate country could really control its southern border areas, Palestinian militant groups saw southern Lebanon as a logical place to set up shop. There was also a subtle, dangerous shift in the complexion of some of the splinter factions here. In the wake of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the new fundamentalist Khomeini government in Tehran began to influence these anti-Israeli groups, changing them from militias fighting for a Palestinian homeland to more hardline Shia extremists. This new area of operations between northern Israel and southern Lebanon quickly became the newest hotspot in the region. Israeli airstrikes and incursions, and sometimes outright invasions, would hit Fedayeen enclaves in Lebanon, already torn by civil war. These increased steadily between 1978 and 82, despite the presence of UNIFIL, that's United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, and United Nations protests. Meanwhile, terrorist attacks based out of Lebanon decreased sharply in the same period, to the point where many observers questioned whether such intense Israeli military action was still necessary. On the contrary, elements of the Israeli government, led by Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, had made up their mind to invade Lebanon wholesale. An assassination attempt of an Israeli diplomat in London was used as a pretext to launch the invasion in June 1982. Now, I won't wade too deeply into whether this invasion was justified. Here in the Op Center, we try very hard to avoid taking sides. But this London attack has been proven to have absolutely nothing to do with Palestinian, Iranian, or Syrian groups in Lebanon. Furthermore, it's clear that Israeli intelligence knew this at the time, yet the invasion was launched anyway. This was a tissue-thin excuse for an aggressive Israeli war. Now, whether this is Sharon's manipulation to settle old scores, or whether Israel was legitimately concerned for the increasing Iranian influence among anti-Israeli militants in Lebanon, I'm going to leave that to the audience. The Israeli invasion of Lebanon starts on June 6, 1982. 
In all, we see five divisions launched in three axes of attack, with three main objectives. These are securing the coastal population centers on the way to Beirut, that's Lebanon's capital, trapping and destroying PLO and other militant enclaves, and fending off any Syrian intervention out of the east. The first route of advance was to the west, along the coast, mounted around the 91st Galilee Division, reinforced with the Golani Infantry Brigade, paratrooper units, and other formations. There was even Israeli naval support and seaborne commandos. This force advanced quickly through Tyr, then Hamadie, and finally up to Sidon. Here, the coastal force met with the Israeli Central Force, built around the 36th Gaash, or Rage Division, and the 162nd Steel Division. This force had already fought serious actions at places like Nabatea and Jezin. Together, these two forces continued to push up the western coast to Beirut, investing the city in what turned out to be a long and bloody siege. Finally, to the east, we have an inland Israeli force built around General Lev's 90th Division and a 252nd Sinai Division. After pushing through Marjeu, this force advanced through some of the thickest PLO enclaves in what was called Fatah Land, pushing north-northeast into the Beka Valley. In some ways, this force had the most thankless task, charged with preventing Syrian intervention and yet restricted by rules of engagement that prevented them from engaging first with Syrian forces. Sure enough, Syrian forces did intervene, kicking off intense battles throughout the Beka Valley. One of the biggest of these was the Battle of Sultan Yaqub, where Syrians actually scored a tactical victory against the Israeli 90th Division. Gazelle attack helicopters armed with hot anti-tank guided missiles, T-72 battle tanks, and BMP-1s using AT-3 Sagar anti-tank missiles, bloodied an Israeli force of infantry and older tanks. These included M60A1 Magox. These are originally US-made patents, which had been fitted with Blazer reactive armor panels. Syrians had a much tougher time when they came up against American-made AH-1 Cobra's attack helicopters and the most powerful new Israeli tank, the Merkava, or Chariot. Israel's first home-designed and manufactured main battle tank, it included a number of innovative, and some would say bizarre, design features like a front-mounted engine, an onboard light mortar, and a small infantry bay in the back of the tank, sometimes used to evacuate wounded. While definitely odd, and perhaps making the Merkava unsuitable for use in other armies, the Merkava was undeniably the perfect tank for the IDF, specifically built around the unique conditions faced by the IDF and hard lessons learned in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Unfortunately, Lebanon did not have a clean ending. The siege of Beirut dragged on for weeks and devastated huge swaths of the city already ravaged by years of previous civil war. Non-Palestinian insurgents were known to use Lebanese civilians as human shields, and the IDF was blamed for large amounts of collateral damage and civilian casualties, and they hardly emerged from the war with anything like a heroic reputation. Pro-Israeli Christian militia groups retaliated against Palestinian refugee centers, resulting in at least two major civilian massacres. Finally, the PLO was allowed to withdraw to countries like Yemen, Syria, and Algeria. But this only left harder-aligned Iranian-supported groups to continue to operate through further years of the Lebanese Civil War. Many of these groups would coalesce into the infamous Hezbollah. Subsequent UN peacekeepers suffered in the years that followed as well, including the bombing of a U.S. Marine Corps barracks, probably the worst day in the Corps' history since the Vietnam War. For wargaming the 1982 Lebanon War, players should first really nail down what kind of game they really want to have. Lebanon was small, short, but complex, with a wide range of both regular and irregular actions. Israeli paratrooper or naval commando actions could best be tackled with systems like Spectre. Larger infantry actions between IDF mechanized infantry and PLO forces could be tackled with force on force, still one of the best systems out there for capturing the real differences between regular and irregular combatants. 
For larger scale battles, like those that took place in the Becca Valley, players can try 6mm clashes between tanks, artillery, and attack helicopters using GHQ micro armor. These are the battles where we see Syrian MiG-23s and Su-22 fighter bombers against Israeli F-16s, anti-tank helicopters like the Syrian Gazelle and Israeli AH-1 Cobra, and the first clash is between Merkava Mark 1s and Syrian T-72s. Games like GHQ Micro Armor really do a good job at capturing the scope of these battles, not only because of the 6mm scale, but also because each piece in this system represents a platoon, not an individual soldier or vehicle. This allows players to more easily capture and recreate the realistic, accurate battalion and brigade organizational levels on which these kinds of engagements really take place. For 15mm WYSIWYG gaming, consider the new Battlefront release, Oil War. Now, I don't have a copy of this book myself yet, obviously, it hasn't come out yet, so I can't give it an honest review, but I am very happy and very impressed with what Battlefront has done with the new Fate of a Nation release for the 1967 and 73 wars. Oil War seems to be sort of a connecting reference to draw these historical timelines in with the new main Team Yankee 1980s setting, and the Merkava, Cobra, M113, T72, and BMP1 miniatures from Battlefront really do look amazing. Here are just a few things to look out for. Make sure your Syrians are using the export T72M rules as we see in Battlefront without reactive armor panels and with the lower combat values than we see with native T72 Soviet units in Team Yankee. This reflects not only the subtle but important differences in the tank itself, but also differences in the crew and especially the available tank ammunition. Starting in the 1960s, guys, tank ammunition becomes almost more important than the tank gun itself as far as how hard it hits, especially against enemy armor. Another thing to look out for is to make sure that your Merkavas in 1982 Lebanon are only the Merkava Mark I with the original 105mm rifle and not the 120mm gun that we'd see in later versions. Since 1982, the Arab-Israeli conflict has continued to evolve. In the late 80s and early 90s, we see the Intifada. This is a major Palestinian uprising in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Here, the IDF struggled to find a new role, more as peacekeepers or almost as police, standing against civilians, sometimes no more than children armed with slings and rocks, rather than enemy tanks and guided missiles. Politics and media were the main weapons here, and the IDF found itself somewhat behind the curve of changing times yet again, in coping with the rise of new organizations in the Gaza Strip like Hamas. 1991 also saw the Israelis almost drawn into the Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein tried launching Scud missiles against Israeli cities. Hussein hoped that by dragging Israel into the war, he could wreck uh, American President Bush's carefully assembled Arab coalition. To their credit, the Israelis did not retaliate despite repeated Iraqi attacks on their cities, and the American-led coalition survived the conflict. Intifada uprisings continued through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, and finally Israel invaded Lebanon again in 2006. Another tense moment came in 2011, with the Arab Spring uprisings starting in Egypt. Now, as I've said, Egypt is the key factor when it comes to national-level threats to Israel, and for 30 years now, America had been pouring military aid into Egypt. Their army now included hundreds of M1A1 Abrams main battle tanks, AH-64 Apache attack helicopters, the absolute best of the best. The thought of another 2010s or 2020s war in the Sinai between Egypt and Israel is actually a little terrifying. And we should all be grateful that so far the political situation in Egypt seems intent on continued coexistence with Israel. And uh, let's earnestly hope it continues to do so in the future. For this week's Q&A section, Intelligent Mr. Toad on OnTabletop.com commented on our Yom Kippur War episode, where he asked, I have only a single concept to add, tactical depth. It would be interesting to see if you can flesh this out with specifics. Man, I, <laughs> I would love to. The problem for me here is that these videos cannot be 
two, three, or four hours long. Now we do have live streams on Twitch. Uh, that's twitch.tv slash sitredpodcast.com almost every Sunday where we break out a war game and play live in the conflict that's under discussion. Our recent Valley of Tears Yom Kippur war game between myself and Damon from the On Tabletop community lasted almost seven straight hours. I'm not kidding about that. And you can believe we got into some very serious tactical depth on that one. Uh, we've also done 1982 Lebanon with uh, LSR 2590 and even Panzer Leader in 1982 Lebanon with um, Gianna here on the Sit Rep Command Team. But in short, it's the constraints in time and bandwidth that we're really up against here in these Op Centers videos. So, I hope you've enjoyed our Op Center series on the Arab Israeli Wars. Come back next week when the Op Center switches over to a new conflict. I'm not going to say very much right now, except that we're staying in 1982 and it gets awfully chilly in the South Atlantic. Meanwhile, you can follow our live gaming channel over on Twitch, subscribe to us on YouTube, or find us on Facebook, on Tabletop, Twitter, and Podbean. You can also support the Sit Rep Podcast on Patreon, or again, check out our great merchandise at zazzle.com slash sitreppodcast. Any kind of support, even if it's just a comment on this video, or a question that we might get to in a future episode, really helps our platform progress to the next level so we can keep bringing you more great modern military gaming content. So once again, that's going to wrap us up for today, everyone. This is Oriskany, and Tango Mike for listening.